All right, so my presentation is on the bag integration, which is basically an alternate form of integration to Riemann integration, as you'll see. So introduction. Um, the Lebesgue integral is basically a more modern integral than the Riemann integral, which is um, the kind that we were all um, introduced to at first. Um, and the Lebesgue integral is useful because it applies to a broader class of functions, um, and that makes it more flexible and just applicable. So, and the Lebesgue integral does include some more theoretical foundations that can make it a little bit difficult to understand at first, but it does have, but this this rigor makes it very um, strong and useful in the future. So the theory that the Lebesgue integral uses is measure theory, and we will get into that later. Um, so who's the guy behind this integral? That would be Henri Lebesgue. He was born in 1875 in the north of France, and he studied in Paris and became a significant figure of the academic circles there. Um, he founded the basis of measure theory in 1901 with his paper called That. Um, and Lebesgue formulated much of the ideas of modern analysis during um, the turn of the century and built upon the ideas of Fourier, Borel, and Jordan. He also made important contributions to other areas of mathematics, such as set theory, topology, and calculus of variations, and later in his life forayed into history and pedagogy. Um, so yeah, Lebesgue was heavily lauded, including being inducted into the Academy of Sciences, and he eventually died in Paris in 1941. Alright, before we get into um, the Lebesgue integration, um, I wanted to go over some terminology that will be useful um, later on. So let's just go over this. There's cardinality, which is the number of elements in the set. Um, countable is a property that set can have. So a set with the same cardinality as some subsets of the natural numbers, including the set of the natural numbers itself is called countable. And a countable set can either be a finite set or it can be countably infinite, which means there exists a bijection between that set and the natural numbers. That just means there's a one-to-one -one, um, relationship, a one-to-one -one mapping between that set and the natural numbers. All right, so power set is the set of all subsets of a set, and it's denoted like this. Um, and actually, here's an example. So of some set, ABC here, this would be the power set of ABC. And you can see this is all possible combinations of the elements in this set, um, which is all subsets. So you have the empty set and then you have all these other subsets, which includes the set itself. Um, then we have disjoint, pairwise disjoint. Um, so it says disjoint if it has an intersection that equals the empty set, um, which is this. And then a set is pairwise disjoint if any two distinct subsets are disjoint. So this is basically talking about um, sets are disjoint and pairwise disjoint if there's no overlap between them. All right, and then we have to go for this symbol right here, which is, um, it just means it's defined as, so it's kind of like an equal sign, except you're saying, oh, we're going to define this thing to equal blank. Um, all right, a little bit more terminology. Infimum is the greatest upper bound of a set. Um, denoted this, and supremum is the least upper bound of a set, denoted sup x. Um, a simple function is a function that only takes on finitely many distinct values. So you can think of just a graph. They often, you'll see like straight lines on various places, like, you know, maybe it's piecewise, or maybe it's just y equals 2, something like that. A characteristic function, also called an indicator function, is a function on some set x that indicates membership of an element in a subset s of x, assigning the value 1 to all elements in the s, and the value 0 to all elements of x that are not in s. Um, and it is denoted 1 and then the subset name here. So this is a visual representation of an indicator function, um, we have that this, this yellow loon shape um, represents the subset in which the elements are assigned the value 1, and then over here, 
this is the area of x, not an s, and they'll be assigned the value of 0. All right, so then finally we have limit inferior, or lim inf, and the limit inferior of a sequence is the limit of the infimum of the sequence. Okay, so measure theory. Measure is basically, measure theory basically studies how big a set is, so you can think of that as like the volume of a set, um, just how much stuff. However, assigning measure to a subset isn't always possible meaningfully, and it turns out only the sets in a sigma algebra can do this. So what is a sigma algebra? And a sigma algebra is essentially a set of all measurable subsets and works as a domain of a measure. So defined formally, we can say that um, let M be a non-empty set, then a collection of subsets, curly A, subset of the power set of M, is called a sigma algebra for M if, and then here are the three properties or conditions they must fulfill. The first one is that the empty set and M are both in curly A. The second one is that if a set A is in curly A, then A's complement M A is also in curly A. Um, and this makes sense because if we know the generalized volume of some A and M, then we should be able to know the generalized volume of M outside of A. So, for example, this is kind of a visual representation of the second property, the square right here, because we know the generalized volume of some A, and we have this M, so then, therefore, um, we should be able to know this blue area. We should know the generalized volume of the complement of A. All right, and then the third property is just that if there exists countable many subsets, A, I, and curly A, where I is an element of the natural numbers, then the union um, from I equals A to infinity of A, I is also in curly A. In other words, the union of infinitely many subsets of A is in curly A. And this makes sense because if each subset A, I is measurable, um, meaning that it has generalized volume, you can think about, then the generalized volume of A should be the limit of the sum of all those volumes A, I. So it too should be measurable. And here's a visual representation of the third property here. We can say there can be up to finitely many pieces of this purple part and if the purple part is um, is in the sigma algebra, meaning that it is a measurable subset, then we we also should um, know that the union of these infinitely many subsets is also in the sigma algebra. Also note that there are often many options for the sigma algebra, um, and note that taking the sigma algebra of just being the power set m is always going to be a sigma algebra. Um, the power set of M will always fulfill these conditions since because it contains all subsets, it is always closed under complements and, co and countable unions. However, more advanced measure theory shows that it generally doesn't provide a very useful sigma algebra if M is non-countable. Okay, so now let's examine some terminology of measure theory. So measure is formally defined in the following way. Um, a measure is a function mu from curly a to r bar, and this symbol here is basically just saying that um, the range of a measure function is like the positive real numbers including infinity, or you can denote it this way, from 0 to infinity, union infinity, and we just don't um, write this as 0 comma infinity with a inclusive bracket on the end because that's just not how it's done, but um, yeah, so this is the range of a measure function, and you can think about how it makes sense because a volume shouldn't be negative, so that's why we don't include the negative numbers. Um, but it could be zero or infinite. Um, and then a measure is a function on a measurable space, m curly a, and it's a map satisfying these, three, these two properties. Um, the first one is that the empty set, um, which is in every sigma algebra, as we saw from the last slide, um, the empty set is assigned the value zero, so mu of empty set is zero. Second property is that if a collection of sets a n and curly a, and um, where n is an, is an element of the natural numbers, and they're pairwise disjoint, so basically there's no 
um, the intersection is the empty set, that's the definition of pairwise disjoint, then the measure assigned to the union of this collection is equal to the sum of the measures assigned to the individual sets. Um, so in other words, when mathematically, it's like this. Um, and then we also can note that if the collection were not pairwise disjoint, then the sum would no longer be equal to this union because you would be adding up repeats basically you'd be over counting so for example here's a visual representation of the second property and you can see that it makes sense because you're basically just taking the measure inside of this um this this union and you're adding up all of these individual measures to get the complete measure of this and you can think about how if you measured let's say a1 also included a little bit of a2 and then you added up a2 now they would no longer be equal and the sum would be greater than this measure of a union. Um, we also call some some set A and curly A and a, a curly A measurable set. Remember that this curly A represents a sigma algebra, just to make sure. Um, and then another thing that we say is that a metro mu is finite if there exists some exhaustive sequence of measurable sets such that each of mu of a n is finite. Um, in other words, mu is finite if there exists um, a1, A2, dot, 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 in curly A with um, the union from any is greater than 1 to infinity and equals M, such that mu of An is less than infinity. And so the, here we can see the in increasing condition and the exhaustive condition. The exhaustive condition is this condition right here. You can't really see it, but it's the union equals the set M. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we call for a metro being finite. Um, now let's look at a couple more definitions. So measurable space is a pair M curly A consisting of a set M and a sigma algebra curly A made of subsets of M. And a metro space is a triple M curly A mu consisting of a set M, a sigma algebra curly A made up of subsets of M and a metro mu which, as we saw before, goes from curly A to R bar. And, yeah, so I know the terms can be a little bit... Um, I don't know who thought of these terms for measurable space, measure space, and measure space, but you can think of their relationship as measurable space plus measure is a measure space because you're just adding the mu, which is the measure, to this um, pair M curly A. And... Measurability is not the property of a single space, it's the property of a collection of sets. And to understand what exactly this is talking about, it's kind of similar to vector spaces. So you can't call a single element a vector unless you know that it is in a vector space, you know, because um, the vector space conditions, which is close under addition, scalar multiplication, that kind of thing, it's those conditions must be fulfilled before you can call something a vector. And it's the same is true for measurability. Um, it's a property of a whole space rather than, and then you can um, call the elements in it measurable. Um, and then an example we can think of is um, one can take the measure of an interval on the real line where measure is just length. So for example, the measure of two comma five would just be three. Um, length is an example of a set function um, from the intervals to the real numbers. But we can also remember that measure can take on other forms for more abstract set functions. So for example, if a set has higher dimensions or the line has weighted numbers, etc., the measure the measure would no longer represent length on an interval on the real line. It could maybe it represents things like probability or something. All right, so now let's go to prop properties of measure. These aren't super relevant to the Lebesgue integral, so I'll just state them pretty quickly. But monotony, sub, which is just saying that um, if some set is smaller than or equal to another set, um, then the measure of that set is less than or equal to the measure of the larger set. Um, Sub additivity is saying that suppose there exists some sequence of measurable sets that aren't necessarily mutually disjoint, then since all those measurable sets are in the sigma algebra just because they're measurable, it must be true that the measure of the union of all those little sets is less than or equal to the sum, 
of the measure of the individual sets. And that's basically referring to the overcounting thing we were talking about on the last slide. Um, so that's kind of restating what we talked about earlier, but in a formal property. And then we have continuity from below. Suppose there exists an increasing exhaustive sequence of measurable sets. So for example, A1 is a subset or equal to A2, subset or equal to A3, etc., etc. And the union of all these little sets is A. Then the limit as n approaches infinity of the measure of these sets is equal to the measure of A. Continuity from above is similar, but the difference is that the, uh, uh, the set is decreasing. And um, so A1 is superset A2, superset A3, dot, dot, dot. And, and a condition that the intersection of all those little sets is A. a and we also have to add the property that the mu of um, the largest set is less than or equal to infinity. Um, then we can say that the limit as an approach is infinity of the measure of a n is equal to the measure of a. So continuity from above and below are saying similar things but for decreasing versus increasing sequences and yeah, the, these properties aren't super relevant to Lebesgue integration, so don't worry if they don't make a ton of sense. All right, so now examples of measure to try to make like all of this mumbo jumbo a little bit more concrete. But so one of them is um, counting measure. So consider a set x in sigma algebra curly a, um, which is a power the power set of x. Um, so no matter what x is it's always possible to define the counting measure. Um, this function, this measure is defined as, um, so for the cardinality of A is less than infinity, the measure is just the cardinality of A. And if not, then the measure is infinity. And it's clear that this function fulfills the con conditions of being a measure, like we're explaining why it's always true that um, A is, and curly a. Um, so the reason is that, first of all, mu of um, the empty set is zero just because empty set has finitely empty, finitely many elements, so it would fall into this top condition and therefore would be assigned the um, value of the cardinality of the empty set, which as we know is zero. So that condition is fulfilled. And the second condition, sigma additivity, is also fulfilled. Um, because, well, we can look at two cases first. Um, for pairwise disjoint sets where um, a n is in a, and then, of course, the, the mu of the union of all of these little a i's is equal to the sum of the mu of, all the, if, of each a i. Um, this is true because the union of the pairwise disjoint subsets of a finite set will be the set for which they are a subset A, and mu of A is the cardinality of A, since A is finite, as we looked at above, which is equal to the sum of the measure of each of these AI, since the measure of any subset will be the cardinality of that subset, since that subset is finite, and the sum of all the cardinalities of pairwise disjoint subsets of A will be the cardinality of A. And then we can now examine the second case, um, where A is not finite. In order to do this, we must define a few calculations for the rules of measure theory. So I think this is just how it's typically defined in measure theory, that x plus infinity is defined to be infinity for all 0 to infinity. x times infinity is also infinity. And then for 0 to infinity, not including 0. And then 0 times infinity is defined to be 0 in most cases. So now when we have those definitions, we can see that um, this this union equaling the sum condition does hold for a being not finite because the left side would end up being mu of a, which is infinity, since a is not finite, and the right side would end up being infinity as well. And if a ha is a set of infinite number of finite subsets, we get an infinite sum of finite numbers, which would be the, the finite numbers we're talking about are the cardinality of each subset, which is infinity. And similarly, if A is an infinite number of infinite subsets, because those are the two ways that A can be infinite, then we also get an infinite sum of infinities, i.e. infinity, since both of these cases yield the same result. They are equal, and therefore sigma additivity is fulfilled. So this is why the counting measure is always um, in sigma algebra.
All right, so another example is probability measure. To set up this situation, consider the natural numbers, a set of the natural numbers m, 1, 2, 3, etc., which is a countably infinite set. Um, consider our sigma algebra to be the power set, um, curly A equals 2 to the m. Um, and we can also note that this power set is indeed a sigma algebra because it fulfills the three conditions of sigma algebra listed in definition 2.1. Um, the whole thing about how the power set is always going to be in sigma algebra. I'm not going to go through them right now, but here they are. So, and then, so now that we have our sigma algebra, we can define a function p of k. So it would really be p of the set k, and we can just shorthand denote it p of k, um, to be the probability that it takes k coin flips to get heads. So note that p of k in this case is representing probability, not power set of k. All right, so this is probability. Um, so this function, it's also called the geometric distribution, will equal this, 1 half times 1 minus 1 half to the k minus 1. And you can think about how this makes sense. Um, because the, well, you can think, so the probability to get the unfavorable outcome tails, um, all previous k minus 1 times in a row is this section, 1 minus 1 half, k minus 1. And then you just stick this 1 half right in front um, to take into account the probability of getting heads on the k flip. So yeah, that, that, this equation makes sense. But anyway, this function p of k is a measure because we can take any set in curly A and decompose it into unique single element sets. And the sum of all the probabilities of these subsets will equal the probability of the entire set. And then, of course, mu of A is the power set, which is greater than 0 for all A in the power set. Because a probability will never be zero just because of how probabilities work. And so mu of the empty set is equal to p of the empty set, which is zero. So hopefully that's starting to be a little bit more concrete, but um, those are just two examples of measure, and some other examples might get deeper into set theory and that kind of thing. So, okay. So in order to do Lebesgue integration, we can zoom in on a more particular part of measure theory, which is Lebesgue measure. So Lebesgue measure differs from regular measure in that a function must fulfill additional conditions in order to be called Lebesgue measurable. Um, so it, it's similar enough to measure that you, the intuition holds, but um, this is when we're talking about Lebesgue integration, we're normally talking about is a function Lebesgue measurable in particular, rather than just measurable. So anyway, the, the, the specifics are just that the Lebesgue measure of an interval a, b is mu of a, b, which is b minus a. Um, we can expand this from an open set in the real numbers, which is what an interval is, to any open set by recognizing that any open set on the real line is a countable union of disjoint intervals. So the Lebesgue measure of an open set a, um, the, the union of a, n, and b, n, um, is the sum of the lengths of these intervals, i.e. the measure of a would be the sum of bn minus an. So that's the similar intuition to intervals. And then we can further generalize this definition to apply to any arbitrary set b, so no longer one that's just open. Um, and we can do this by approximating some arbitrary set b with open sets, and then using the open set definition of Lebesgue measure. So formally, we can say that the Lebesgue measure of a set b is um, the infimum um, B subset A, where A is open of the measure of A. And this formatting is a little weird, but it's basically just the infimum of um, measure of A. Um, all right, so now the Lebesgue integral. Before defining the Lebesgue integral, let's just first review the intuition behind the Riemann integral so that we can have better contrast and uh, yeah, so the Riemann integral is the more common integral, um, especially in beginning mathematics. But so what we're talking about with the Riemann integral is that we are partitioning a function's domain, as we can see here in this kind of visual, um, this visual representation. This is what you talked about in your calc classes, that kind of thing. 
um, we imagine partitioning it into rectangles. Rather, it's a lower sum or an upper sum, a right sum, left sum, midpoint sum, trapezoid. Either time, you're always partitioning a function's domain, and um, we are asking. Essentially, what we're asking is what in whatever version you're working with, for example, what lower y value corresponds to a given interval of x values. And so we're saying, like, what for this um, interval of x values, what y value roughly corresponds to it, right? And you might say, oh, this here. And then we take the limit of the sum of these rectangles, which are the interval times that corresponding y value. And we take the limit of the sum of these rectangles as the interval length approach zero or the number of the intervals approach infinity, which is um, which will be the same because the interval will approach zero as the number of um, intervals approach infinity. So that's the intuition behind the Riemann integral. Um, however, there are several problems with this method of integration. And they become more apparent as the functions one wishes to integrate become more complicated. So here's Riemann here. And we're just going to go over some problems with Riemann integration. So first of all, um, Riemann integration is difficult to expand to higher dimensions. Um, it can be done. Like you'll see that if you do Calc 3 and that kind of thing. But the process is very laborious. And it's because you can no longer just use use rectangles to partition like a 3D graph or what about 4D or 5D that kind of thing um you ha so it gets um one for example in three dimensions one has to resort to cuboids and come up with a whole new expression of volume to take the limit of in addition the bounds present problems when integrating in higher dimensions so in one dimensional space one can just integrate over an interval a b but in higher dimensions, these bounds quickly get more complicated as there are many variables that one must contend with and specify. So the in interval's in every direction, and it gets worse. Like, for example, what if you wanted to integrate over a circle rather than a square region when you're working with a, a function of, of two or three variables? So it, it just gets um, more complicated. Um, it is possible, of course, to use Riemann's method to integrate this way, and for example, you can transfer to cylindrical or polar coordinates, and that might simplify the process a little bit. But overall, you do have to do a lot more work to form the limit to approximate the volume with a partition. Um, another problem of Riemann integration is its dependence on con continuity. So in order to integrate a function using this method, this given function must have only finitely many points of discontinuity, um, and this severely limits the functions that one is able to integrate. Um, and then finally, um, one problem that we have is Riemann's integral's relationship to limit processes. Um, especially with one is working in series and integrals in situations such as the one below right here. Um, and you're wondering, you really, maybe you're working with one of these and you really, really want to pull the limit sign inside of here or vice versa. And that's just a problem because according to Riemann integration, when one has an expression of a limit of an integral, it is required that the integrand converges uniformly for one to be able to put the limit sign inside the integral. Um, uniform convergence of the integrand can be a difficult and very restrictive condition, and it's not very helpful because uniform convergence is somewhat related to continuity. So, like if you have a function that's not continuous with finite, like, many, like there's not finitely many points of discontinuity, it just then you can't really do much at all. Um, and what's weird is that there are many examples where there's no uniform convergence of the integrand, and yet the limit of the integral indeed is equal to the integral of the limit. And this makes us wonder, hmm, maybe those things are actually equal under more conditions than just uniform convergence of the series. And maybe there's a way, there's another method in which we don't need to impose such a restrictive condition. And that's... Um, partly how Lebesgue integration arose. So now let's see how Lebesgue integration works. So first we're going to do a little intuition and derivation. So suppose we wish to integrate some function f from um, r3 to r, so like three dimensions to just the real line. It would be very complicated to find a meaningful partition for the domain, like a partition 
in R3, but the range is only R, so that's a lot simpler. Um, and it's thus easier to partition. So we can do, we can choose to partition the range with Lebesgue integration. And we can partition the y-axis just as we would partition the x-axis in Riemann integration. We define an upper sum of the rectangles um, that is approximate the area under the curve by multiplying the supremum of the function on each interval by the interval length. We can do the same to create a lower sum by multiplying the infimum of the function on each interval by the interval length. Now we can take two, some two f of x values, thus choosing our de decomposition. Like here we, we have these um, chosen decomposition. So then we find all the parts of the function that are in between these two values. Um, and this means that we find the intervals where the function is between these two lines. And then um, we find the corresponding x values. Um, so these intervals won't necessarily be connected. So we are essentially partici partitioning the values of a function. Um, so here you can see that this part of the function is in between the chosen y values. So then we can look at the corresponding interval. So the key idea is that we're partitioning range. Um, in order to find area, we must know the interval quote-unquote length so we can multiply it by those functions and I say quote-unquote length and also just take this with this visual representation as, uh, with a grain of salt because I'm really referring to like arbitrary dimensional space so this could be a line it could be a plane it could be a three-dimensional space but whatever this is this just represents the domain and then here we have f of x anyway though so um, so in order to find the quote-unquote area, we must know the interval length so we can multiply it by those function values. Um, to measure an interval, we just need to measure the size of sets inside um, the space where the inputs lead to the chosen f of x values. So since we can look at the Lebesgue integral as a function from this space to the real numbers, we'll have an integral that works on all functions that are defined on this measure space. And that's all we need to define the integral. So there's a lot less conditions than the Riemann integral. So suppose measure is mu, then if ci, labeled here, is the i partition element, um, and just note that a function value f of x for a function value f of x, then a rectangle area would be ci times the mu, or measure, of ai, um, for example this, which is a function value times the measure of the interval. And also note that ci can be an upper or a lower sum, depending on which we choose. Um, yes, so we can sum up all of these rectangles and take the limit as the number of rectangles approaches infinity to get the interval of a, a chosen area. And this is what we're saying with this, so we're, just like with Riemann where we approximated with a sum, we're doing the same for here, but we're just partitioning range rather than domain, and we're utilizing measure to describe this corresponding x values or corresponding domain values. So yeah, and then this is the Lebesgue integral, and we say d mu to denote um, measure. All right, now the formal um, formal definition. So we can derive the formal definition by using positive simple functions first. Remember, simple functions are functions that take on only finitely many different values. So simple functions can be written as linear combinations of characteristic functions of sets. Um, and this just um, what linear combinations are. Here's an example. So you're just adding um, characteristic functions possibly times a scalar multiple. All right, so they can be written as linear combinations of characteristic functions of sets, and this means that the Lebesgue integral of a simple function can be expanded to just be a sum for i equals 1 to n of ci times the measure of the interval of xa, sum xa i, over which the function takes on that value ci. So here's what it looks like written now. And we can define it to be the Lebesgue integral of the positive simple function f equals c1 xa1 plus dot 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 plus cn xan is this. Um, and we're just we're just changing all of this to the measure of a1 and the measure of an.
Okay, so now we can generalize from positive simple functions to just simple functions in general by first recognizing that uh, that the integral of a negative function would just be the negative version of this expression. And then for a function that's both positive and negative, we can write it in this way. Um, this function would be equal to the positive part of the function plus the negative part of the function. And therefore, we can just write it as the integral of the positive part minus the integral of the negative part. And this would take on a positive value. Note, note that. Yeah, so that should be pretty intuitive. And then we can now generalize to arbitrary functions so they don't have to be simple anymore. And we can do this by approximating arbitrary functions with simple functions. And so the Lebesgue integral of a function f over measure of space x is defined as the supremum where g is less than or equal to f and g is simple of the integral of g d mu over x. Um, and then we say that a function is mu integrable if the integral of f d mu over x is finite. In other words, we're saying that with some simple function g is less than or equal to f, the integral of a function f over x is equal to the smallest upper bound of the integral g over x. So the great thing about Lebesgue integration is that a function is only not integrable in that one case when the integral equals infinity. Um, in every other situation, it's possible to integrate a function. Therefore, Lebesgue integration is very applicable, flexible, and useful. Alrighty, so let's go over some properties of the Lebesgue integral, and then we'll move to some examples. So one is linearity, and it's basically saying you can just split up an integral, as we see here, um, into two pieces and you can um, take out scalar multiples. I mean, when I say two pieces, you can break it up into however many pieces. Um, and this is just like Riemann integral, which also has this property. All right, another one is monotone convergence theorem. So if a series Fn converges to F monotonically, then the integral of the series converges to the integral of F. And then finally, we have the dominated convergence theorem, which is that if a series, if the absolute value of a series is less than or equal to g, where g is some integrable function, g is sometimes called an integrable majorant. But anyway, so if fn is less than or equal to g and fn converges to f, then we can say that the integral of fn converges to the integral of f. So these are getting the same results, but the dominated convergence theorem has a somewhat more useful quality to it because this condition, it tends to be easier to find this integrable majority g rather than have the more somewhat more restrictive function that fn converges to f monotonically. But here's kind of a, a little chart of the different theorems of these convergence theorems, and they all have slightly different conditions. Um, and we're all trying to, in all of these cases, we're saying, we're wondering if you can take out the limit sign, basically. Because saying this, that the integral of fn converges to f, what you're doing, that is the same statement as saying that these two are equal. Um, and so, yeah, so monotone convergence theorem is saying you can do this if um, fn is non decreasing, that's what it means for monotonically, and then dominated is um, the, the fn is dominated by some function that is integrable called g. All right, and then in order to prove the dominated convergence theorem, I'm not going to prove these two right now just because, like, you know, there's not that much time, but in order to prove the dominated convergence theorem, we can actually use Fatou's lemma, which is saying that, well, you'll see in the next slide. So, okay, first assume we are working on a metro space x curly a mu, and actually this is supposed to say m, so just pretend it's m curly a mu. Um, and the sequence of functions fn from m to the real line is measurable for all n in the natural numbers, and the function f from m to the real line has a series fn of x, converging to fx as n approaches infinity for some x in m. So also assume that the absolute value of this series is less than or equal to g, where g is our integrable majority. So this is basically another way of stating that. It is, that's just a way of saying it's Lebesgue integrable um, 
Um, this is just defining a function, L of mu, L1 of mu, defining it as f from m to r, and it's measurable. And the integral over m of f, absolute value f1 d mu, is finite. So basically, we're just saying it's, g is a finite measurable function that dominates fn. Because the absolute value of fn is less than g by monotonicity, which is basically the monotone convergence theorem that we were seeing on the last slide, uh, we know that integral of fn d mu over m is less than or equal to integral of n, uh, to the integral of g d mu over m, and that is less than infinity. Um, and thus, f1, f2, etc., etc., are all in l1 mu. Since the absolute value of f is less than g, is measurable almost everywhere because g is, um, then f is an element of l1 of mu as well. So now we can wish to show that the integral of absolute value fn minus f d mu over m approaches 0 as n approaches infinity. So that's kind of, if we can show that, then we'll be able to show our whole limit um, convergence thing, as we'll see. But first we need to show this condition. So we know it must be true that the absolute value fn minus f is less than or equal to fn plus f. And you can just think about that as like, you're adding these two, which are both positive versus you're subtracting them. Obviously, this one's going to be greater than or equal to this one. So now we can extend this statement to say that absolute value fn minus f is less than or equal to fn plus absolute value f, which is also less than or equal to 2g because we know that both f and fn absolute values are each at most g, and so added together, they're at most 2g. And now, moving on, we can say that since... What occurs almost nowhere, the complement of almost everywhere, it doesn't matter for integration. We can omit that almost everywhere bit and just not no not and just not worry about that condition that we were saying earlier um, about f measurable almost everywhere. Um, anyway, by subtracting f and minus f from both sides of our inequality, we get a new inequality, and we can say that some function hn, which we define to be 2g, minus absolute value fn minus f is greater than or equal to zero. Um, we just, we just ex subtracted this. So then the properties of measurable functions say that hn will also be measurable. All right, so then Fatu's lemma says that um, the integral of lim as lemma approaches infinity of hn d mu over m is less than or equal to the limit of the infimum of, oh, that's supposed to be a lim inf. Okay, you pretend that's a lim inf. Um, the lim inf as n approaches infinity of h n d mu is less than or equal to the lim inf of as n approaches infinity of integral of h n d mu. So we can simplify the left side of this inequality first. We know that the pointwise limit of h n exists and thus should be equal to the limit inferior. And since absolute value f n minus f will become zero, we end up with um, the integral over m of lim as n approaches infinity, hn d mu, equaling the integral of 2g d mu. Um, we can similarly rewrite the left side, which becomes the limit inf of this whole thing as n approaches infinity. Since limit as n approaches infinity of the integral of 2g d mu equals the integral of 2g d mu, just because of how we define 2g. And since in order to find the smallest possible hn, we must subtract the largest possible absolute value fn minus f because of how we define hn. So, I mean, this is smallest if this is largest. Um, we switch the limit to a limb soup. So this whole expression becomes the integral over m of 2g d mu plus the limb soup as n approaches infinity of the integral over m of absolute value fn minus f d mu. We now have a rewritten inequality and we can subtract the integral over m of 2g d mu from both sides to get zero is less than or equal to the negative limb soup of this integral. And that's really cool. We just move the limb soup to the other side and now we have this. And that's very useful because um, since a limb soup is always greater than or equal to Oops. So since a limb soup is always greater than or equal to a limb inf, this is supposed to say a limb inf, we can state that the limb inf as n approaches infinity of the integral of fn minus f 
less than or equal to the limb soup of that very same thing. And this is less than or equal to zero because of what we have derived right here. Since the integrand is not negative, we can bound our expression on the other side as well because we know that this is not going to be a negative number because this is not a negative number. Um, and we take the limit. All right, so now we have it bounded on either side by zero. That is very useful because we know that just by the way of these inequalities work, if some inequality is bounded on either side by the name num by the same number, we know that everything in it is going to be equal. So we switch all these inequality signs to equal signs, and we end up with lim as n approaches infinity of the integral over m of f absolute value f n minus f is equal to zero. That is cool. Um, we now have the tools to arrive at the Bag's dominated convergence theorem. First, we know that zero is less than or equal to the integral of f n d mu minus the integral of f d mu. Um, and we can just write this expression using the linearity property as one single integral um, of f n minus f. And then we know this integral will be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of f n minus f just because absolute values can only be greater um, since you're not subtracting things from positive values, which will approach zero as n approaches infinity. So if we simply rearrange this, we're able to say that the limit n approaches infinity over m of f n d mu is the integral of f d mu over m, and that is the dominating convergence theorem. So that's fairly cool and applicable. I'm not going to go through some examples of that right now because this presentation is getting long, but those examples are many, so feel free to look them up. All right, we're almost done. We're just going to go through a few examples. First of all, a piecewise function. Um, example on this famous piecewise function. So define f of x as being 0 when x is rational and 1 when x is irrational. Here's a little picture of that from 0 to 1. Yeah, we're just looking at the domain from 0 to 1 right now. And this is a very misleading picture, as you see, because we cannot get a great picture since there are infinite rational and irrational numbers. But anyway, this is the function we're looking at. And this is not Riemann integrable because the, in order to be Riemann integrable, there have to be finitely many discontinuity points, and this function certainly does not have finitely many discontinuity points. In fact, every single point is discontinuous. So it's not Riemann integrable, but um, it is Lebesgue integrable since it's a simple function, meaning it takes on finitely different, finitely many different values, such as just 0 or 1. So moreover, we can actually calculate this integral. So what do you think it's going to be? Take your guesses, um, and then we'll we'll show you how to integrate it here. So we know that this, this little equation is true because of the properties of Lebesgue integration as we've discussed. And we also know from our previous definition of measure that the measure of a union of pairwise disjoint sets is equal to the sum of the measures of each set. And we can represent this set as a knot where x is rational as Q intersection x in 0, 1. So this is this is representing the rational numbers, and we're saying all rational numbers on this domain. Um, the set A1 where x is irrational can similarly be represented as a not complement on the interval, or as the domain's intersection with the irrational numbers, which we can just write the irrational numbers as the rational numbers complement. Um, again, so we can write this as f of x is a naught plus a1, um, and since a naught equals this and a1 equals that, we can recognize that the rational numbers are countable. Um, they're, they're a famous countable set, um, so its measure is zero. So we written, we know that the measure of a naught, which is the measure of the rational numbers on the domain, is zero. And we also know that the measure of the interval 0, 1 is just length, which we know will be 1. And the measure of irrational numbers on the interval is the interval length minus the measure of rational numbers on the interval, just by thinking it out logically. So the measure of the irrational numbers on the interval will just be 1 minus 0 equals 1, because 1 is the length of the interval minus the measure of rational numbers is 1. 
so the measure of a1 well remember a1 is where x is irrational so the measure of a1 is just the measure of the irrational numbers on the domain which is the measure of the interval minus which is the measure of the interval aka the length of the interval minus the measure of the rational number so we have one minus zero is one so now that we know the measure of each individual set we can plug it back into this equation right here calculate the interval so zero times the measure of a naught which is zero so we have zero times zero plus one times the measure of a one which is one times one which is one so the measure of this whole thing is one and this actually makes sense intuitively because almost all numbers are irrational. Actually, the probability that a random number on the interval is irrational is 1. So that's kind of crazy. Thus, the value of f of x is 1 for almost all of the interval. So it makes sense that the integral value should be 1 because it's just 1 times 1 is 1. Any finite or countable set can be, for the most part, ignored during bag integration so this whole x rational thing didn't matter all right a final example the Cantor function this is quite the example all right the Cantor ternary function is a function that has infinite discontinuities to get a sense of its nature we can begin by defining the interval 0 1 into three equal pieces so I can't really draw this out right now, but I wish I could. But just try to picture as we go along. And here's like a little thing to um, represent it. And here's like a rough approximation of the function. So, so we begin by dividing the interval into three pieces. Here's the first piece, here's the second, and this is the third. Um, on the middle section from one third to two thirds, um, the function takes on the value of one half. Then we divide the first section from x equals 0 to x equals 1 third into three equal pieces. So 1, 2, and 3. The function over the middle section from x equals 1 ninth to x equals 2 ninth takes on a value of 1 fourth. In the third piece from our initial partition where x ranges from 2 thirds to 1, we divide that into three pieces just like we did for this section. In the middle section, this time from 7 ninths to 8 ninths, takes on the value 3 fourths. This process is repeated, so each interval of length 1 ninth is partitioned into three pieces, and the function over the middle section takes on values of 1 eighth, 3 eighths, 5 eighths, 7 eighths, and the values are increasing from left to right, as we can see. So this process continues infinitely, where you just divide up into three pieces, etc., etc. So mathematically, here's a little summary it's not very helpful because there's um because it's an infinite process but here's your representation um and so let's wonder what is the integral from zero to one of this function hmm. you can make a guess to yourself and i will do it with lebesgue integration um using Riemann's method let's just note that integrating this function would be very difficult um, we can do it with Lebesgue. So we can do Lebesgue integration by starting with a simple function and then take a limit of them to approximate the actual function. We can begin defining our indicator function um, as this. That's just remember how we denote it. Below as f1 equals 1 half times 1 from 1 third to 2 thirds. So here's the little subset. It's from... It's an interval from one third to two thirds here in this case. This is the F1 where we did that first initial partition into three pieces. And F2, where we partitioned again, was um, one half times this um, this one from one third to two thirds plus one fourth times one from one ninth to two ninth plus three fourths times the indicator function from one ninth to two ninths. Um, and that should actually be, that should not, that's not correct actually, but, um, that should be from 7 ninth to 8 ninths. But now let us find a way to generalize this formula. So we can define the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x as being equal to the limit as it approaches infinity of this series. So let us begin calculating to see if a pattern emerges. Um, and note that this is something that we got from the dominant convergence theorem. So the first integral would be just, just calculated via integral lengths, just simple stuff here. 
would be one th one half times one third, which is one sixth, but we're going to leave it that way just because it'll be easier to see a pattern. The second integral, we can also just take this basic integral by just using areas in a brute force type of way, and it, we will get this value. We can rearrange this a little bit and turn it into this. And now we can begin to see a pattern that emerges. So the first one we had one half times one third times one. The second time we had one fourth times one ninth times one plus three. The next time we have one over two to cubed, which is eight, times one over three cubed, which is 27, times one plus three plus five. So you can see that we're merging. We're adding the odd numbers, and then we're just doing one over two to the n plus one over, uh, times one over three to the n. So here we go, all the way up to 1 to the 2n minus 1. It's 2n minus 1 because we can see how in the beginning this is the first case and we have to subtract that 1 because otherwise we would just get 2 here. All right, so we can further simplify the rightmost factor by putting it in sigma notation and then using summation rules. So let's just simplify this even more. So we have the odd numbers. We can just simplify this little factor here. So we have the odd numbers. We can write this as... 2 times 1 minus 1 plus 2 times 2 minus 1 plus 2 times L minus 1. And this can be the sum from I equals 1 to L of 2I minus 1. And this is also just by using sum rules, we can take out this 2, this constant multiple, and then we can split up this sum. And so we end up with, and then the, the, there's that classic sum rule that the integral from I to something of I, you can rewrite that as just um, L times L plus 1 over 2. Um, that's a classic rule. And so then we, we've gotten rid of the sigma altogether. And we have 2 times this minus L because the integral from I equals 1 to L of 1 is just L. And this we can, of course, simplify down to L squared. So this would greatly reduces the complexity of our expressions. And we end up the integral of the series is that whole thing that I'm not going to say out loud, but um, that was just through basic algebra. Now we can um, rewrite that even further by putting it back into sigma notation. Because um, you can see we were beginning to see a pattern right around here. And rewrite that as this and then simplify it by just using algebra. See, we, we begin to simplify it and until we come to this, which lo and behold, it's a geometric series. Um, well, it's almost a geometric series. Um, the, the, this whole thing of i equals 1 makes it a little bit different. But anyway, we can apply this new representation of the integral of fn to the original integral expression and evaluate. So we can now insert our new expression for the integral of fn. And since an integral will equal the value that an approximating series converges to, so we can say that the limit of f is equal to the limit, oh, this is a typo, the limit of the integral of f in dx, which is the limit of what we said right here, of this. And again, we can just change this little index by um, putting pulling a, pulling a two-thirds to the front so that we can make it starting at zero. And thus, since um, geometric series, if the... Um, if the t if the number that it is being raised to a power is less than one, then the series converges, and we know it converges to a over one minus r, where a is the fact where where a is the coefficient and r is the number being raised to powers. So then we can just say that this series will converge to um, one sixth over one minus two-thirds, which is equal to one-sixth over one-third, which is equal to one-half. Yes, so we now have found an answer for this function, and I wonder, I bet a bunch of you guys guessed that it would be one-half, um, and it does make sense that it would be one-half, because um, one, because if you think about one, like, copying this little graph here and then rotating it 180 degrees you can see how it would fit right on top and it would fill up this whole one by one square so since uh, two copies of this graph would fill up a one by one square you know one copy would fill up half a square so it does make sense so that was fun
And now we can just briefly go over some applications and significance. Um, the applications, um, the Lebag Integral has many significant impacts. The main one is basically just how it allows for the um, for more foundations in modern science because of all this rigor. So, of course, the dominating convergence theorem is very applicable as well. Um, anyway, so the direct applications are probability theory, lots of physics applications, because mostly because physics is an area where this kind of higher math is needed um, and used a lot. So, especially in quantum physics, for example, function spaces, um, here we have Hilbert, which is Hilbert of the Hilbert space, which is the function space with infinite dimensions. Um, and also in differential geometry, which is used in particle physics. So basically, the Lebesgue integral provides um, a theoretical rigor, which is useful in much of science, and it forms the foundations, just like this house foundation right here. So yes, um... Conclusion, yes, it's harder to understand probably, but it's and it's also computationally less preferable sometimes, like some of those examples were a bit arduous, but it is extremely helpful and it can do what the Riemann integral cannot do, and it is elegant in the theoretical foundations of modern science. So um thank you and good night. Here's the bibliography.